good evening or good afternoon or good morning depending on where in the world you're joining us from and welcome to the second in our series of six weekly widening horizons webinars brought to you as a collaboration between the guild of one name studies and the local population studies society when we last checked we had 223 attendees registered which again is a fantastic audience so we're delighted to have you all with us today i am alan morehouse from the guild seminar organizing committee the guild has in the past organized four in-person seminars each year and planning for these normally starts 12 to 18 months beforehand but in the present COVID situation, we've had to rapidly learn how to convert from a physical to a virtual seminar and understand all the technology behind bringing a webinar to you. So please be gentle with us if there are any hitches from this, which is our first attempt at a live presentation. All webinars in the series are being recorded and you will be notified when the recording is available on the Guild website, uh, which is normally three to five days after so hopefully by early next week after 14 days those from the guild will be available to guild members only if you have any problems with volume please ensure that your computer volume level is turned up and if you have a headset this often helps we hope that the presentation will generate some questions for our two presenters so please enter these in the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel or dashboard which should really be, probably be off to the right of your screen. <clears throat> Our speaker tonight is Paul Carter, a passionate genealogist and local historian, who is also a software and web developer and co-founder of Name and Place. In addition to producing and supporting websites for a number of leading professional genealogists and family history organisations, he is the website manager for the British Association for Local History. Paul is a regular contributor of Tech Tips articles for Family Tree magazine and gives regular talks on ways to better support family and local history research through technology. Following his presentation, Paul will be joined for the Q&A by Pam Smith, who is a local historian and the other co-founder of Name and Place. She's a former professional genealogist and member of AGRA. Pam manages the one place study of Rillington in North Yorkshire and helped to set up the historical Rillington study group. So with no further ado, welcome to Paul Carter. Thank you, everybody. Um, right. Can I just check that um, my screen is showing before I go any further? Yeah. Great. Thank you. OK, good evening, everybody, or as Alan said, uh, if it's another part of the world, good afternoon or good morning. Um, I'm going to, for the next sort of just short of an hour, just um, give you a bit of an insight into One Place Studies, our thoughts about them and how they can be used to support other types of uh, history research studies. Um, so there we go. One Place Study. Um, what are they? Well, in essence, they're a community study of names and places within a defined geographic area and over a specific time frame. And um, they can vary anything beyond that. Um, why do people start one? Um, quite often, family historians get involved in them, uh, wanting to place their ancestor or a group of ancestors in context of their surroundings. Perhaps it's a place close to their heart where they live or somewhere that maybe they grew up or just a part of the country they enjoy going to. Um, somewhere that gives them a sense of belonging um, and that love of a history around a building, a monastery, a church or a school. The list is honestly endless. Um, this picture you can see is this is Warren Percy. It's a deserted medieval village which is which um, there was still a farming community until long, long after the original inhabitants left. And it's still got that sense of place even today. Um, typically, a one place study is a village. I'd, I'd imagine I've never sort of done the statistics, but I would expect most to sort of fall into that category um, and often would be a more thriving place than Warren Percy in that they have a regular inhabitants in the past and still today and will have changed over time. Perhaps it's somewhere near where you live or simply somewhere that you connect to. Equally, 
Um, house history is a very popular theme at the moment with the television series and um, a place can be a house it doesn't need to be a village um, you can literally just drill it right down to that that home was it always a home did it have a former purpose um, who lived there what was the context of their lives what was the affluence of the area around that home did that change over the time was it a slum originally and it's become quite affluent or vice versa Equally, you could extend that out to a street study, um, you know, a group of houses, perhaps a high street with the shops and the trades over time. How did that evolve? How did that reflect how the village in general evolved? Or simply extending that house history concepts from not just the house to who were the neighbours around there and helping to set that context as to the type of people who um, lived in, 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 that, in that one street. Obviously, as I said, family history comes into this quite often um, and it's that, that ability to be able to delve deeper than the genealogy, looking beyond that, looking at the real context of your ancestors' lives. Um, what were their concerns? What was their route to work? What, where, where were their local shops? Where did they worship? Uh, where did they go to school? Um, did they travel far? Where are other members of the family? It's it, who were their neighbours? Who were their friends? It's just giving you that general context. And again, also looking at the affluence of the area, you know, were they poor people? Were they typically poor in the whole village? Or was they maybe just um, there were richer people around them? Who were the landowners they worked for? All those sort of things. It's just setting context and just looking that bit broader than just simply the family and so the genealogy itself. And equally, of course, surname studies are a big part of why we're here tonight. Um, we're all passionate about surname studies where everybody's sharing their name, the derivations. And in particular, what really excites me with this is the hotspots, because while you're looking at uh, where people with each um, surname lived, um, where are they grouped? You know, where are those individual locations where there's a lot of occurrences of that surname? And there you can start maybe to look at a one place study to extend out into that, to look at the context of what those people did there. What were their lives like? What was the environment like and how that changed over time? So extending purely away from just locating the individual people. And equally, of course, with surname studies, migration. Um, is a you know big part of uh, what we're interested in there and you can look to see about who came to this place how long did they stay where did they go to um, where did they come from and you know it's it just again it just sort of setting that context and trying to identify the reasons why they did these things um, population as I just said with the migration, you know, population shifts over time, could be a shift from agricultural to industrial or decline of an industry. Um, typically, for example, there's a, a project I researched, which was a very agricultural area down here in Kent and a mine opened. Where did the miners come from? In fact, in that case, they all came from Yorkshire. They were imported in the experts, but the mine didn't last that long. And where did the miners go after they um, the mine closed. Did they stay locally or did they leave? And it's just identifying that context more than just purely the migration, but trying to identify more of a story and more of the reasons why some of these things happen. So it's in a way supporting that population studies. Um, a lot of um, there's there's kind of a grey area really between how you define a one place study and a local history project because I mean in essence one place studies are local history projects. Um, how we generally try to identify them is, for example, something more specific. Perhaps it's a research of a churchyard. That's a very popular thing that um, a lot of organisations are doing. Um, with the World War One um, centenary. War memorial research was very popular. We identify all of those names listed on the memorial and finding out more about their lives, not just that cold, hard fact of their rank and their age and where they died, but where did they come from? What families did they leave behind? What lives could they have led? 
And by being able to just look at that all in context, it's 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 a completely different way of, of grouping people together. Likewise with the graveyard, as we all know, it, uh, memorial inscriptions are rich with uh, data to um, find out about these people. So then you can start to look at the context, look at those groupings of patterns, perhaps then with the burial records, there's a pattern which identifies a time of infant mortality or a, or a particular period of illness outbreak where there's an increase. Um, so it's just being able to look at these sort of groups of, of people in different ways and identify some new stories. So a community of name and places within a defined geographic area over a time frame. So it can be a village, it could be a town if you're brave enough, but of course you've got to be realistic about the volume of data you can generate here. You know, we're one name study uh, researchers will know this well, as, as well as those that collect population study data, that the volume of your data can increase quite dramatically. So you need to be quite careful how much you actually decide to take on. A census of a small village may stretch to say 20 pages. A census of a small town could be several hundred pages, and that's quite a lot of names to start um, processing and, and assessing. As I said, it could be an institution, a graveyard, a war memorial, a factory, a mine, you know, the, the list is really endless. But equally, a place could move. A ship could be a place. So why not a, a research project researching the crew of a ship, perhaps a ship from the First or Second World War? Where did the ship go? Look at the ship's logs. So they're fascinating uh, records that I've looked at at the National Archives a few times. You know, where, where where was that ship actually posted? Who were the crew on board? Where did they come from? Where did they go to? You know, it, it doesn't have to be a static place. And if you're interested in that photo, second from the left on the middle row, that's my great grandfather. Um, so the study time period. It's really essentially up to you. I mean, I suggest traditionally people starting out um, will look straight to the Victorian period where we've got sort of like a prevalence of records, but equally they may jump a lot earlier or they may wish to start later on. Um, it doesn't really matter, but it usually helps to start with a major data set such as a census and build up from there. So for example, if you're looking at a village, perhaps you may pick the 1871 census and say right uh, there is a static population at that moment in time now I'll start layering on other information such as baptisms burials marriages wills and so on um, so you're sort of giving it a starting point um, the records you can use for a, a study are endless really I mean really sort of extending out from what you would do typically with family history research or other types of historical research um, census returns as I said parish registers civil registration memorial inscriptions they form the core and additional records add color both to an individual and also the community um, it gives you a holistic overview which enables many types of statistical analysis and this collective data can be used for one name studies in a defined area, population studies and equally house histories. You know, it depends on the context of the study. But there's the option to drill down into a person's record, um, enabling the events and facts to come out, to flesh out the bones of a life, to identify the occupations and the post holders and, and images from a traditional family history view. It's just adding so much more color, so many more layers. Um, so yes, it's a community overview. Uh, and I think that's a really important message we would like to get across, that it's about being able to see a community from different levels, from that individual person or where they got married or where they went to work every day, up into the context around where they lived, the street, their environment, up to what was that community like as a whole? What were its challenges? And then further on, I mean, for example, a, an industry declining. I think of the lead mining industry in Cumbria. 
that created quite a population shift as those people who were heavily involved in that industry moved during the mid 19th century. So you can look to see what wider events are impacting, but you're able to explore your research at all these different levels. But the key thing is it's your choice, it's your project, you're, you're in control. And as I started at the beginning, it's about where you're connected, what gives you some passion, what gives you some interest. And that's really what to, to what, where to start. And you define the rules. It is your project. So anyway, this evening, I'm going to introduce you to Rillington. Um, now, this is a small village. It's based in North Yorkshire. And in particular, it's Pam's one place study and a part of the world which is very close to her heart. So it's where she connects and where she feels at home, to be honest. It's also significant for us at Name and Place as it's our first project and the one that we still use predominantly for our testing and our demonstrations. So it means that the whole Name and Place team are familiar with the names and events in and around Rillington, even if never actually visited there. And that actually extended to us demonstrating Rillington over in the US earlier this year. And quite, quite extraordinary to just sort of feel that we're bringing these old lives, you know, so far away from home. So anyway, so Rillington is about midway between York and Scarborough up there on the coast. And it's on the, the border of the Yorkshire Wolds, which are these lovely sort of gently undulating hills which stretch really from across from York sort of across to the English coast and then down towards the Humber and Hull in the south. And Rillington just really sort of sits on the edge of it. So as you sort of look out beyond there, you can see the Wolds. And in fact, this photo was taken from up on the Wolds, looking down in towards Rillington. And if you may not be able to see in this image, but just towards the left of the buildings in the middle is the, is the parish church. But those buildings there centered, that's pretty much Rillington. So it's not a big place. Um, these are the population figures for um, the 18, for, for the 19th century. And you can see that there was a, a gradual increase, sort of peaking around the mid, middle part of the century, and then it's steadily dropping off again. And if we look at that in graphical form, you can see that that peak was on the 1851 census, where it was 1,228 people. That breaks down that population into these industries. So you can see that it's a heavily agricultural village um, with trade and industry supporting that. Um, the railway came at a time here. So there was a small increase in the transport workers, but equally there was there's a, there's a brick, the Rillington brick. It's quite a famous one and it's very common up there, very obvious. It's sort of a, a, a real textured brick. So there were plenty of people working in that. But equally, there were the shopkeepers and the people to just generally maintain life around there. Um, but you can see that that uh, split was predominantly agricultural. And if we break down into the um, agricultural industry for 1851, you see there's obviously unsurprisingly, there's a high number of agricultural laborers but noticeably, there's quite a lot of farmers. And this is really because Rillington was a republic. It's a little bit unusual in that way, in that it didn't have a few main landowners. There was a lot more sort of uh, divisions of land and more equal ownership. So in, in, in that respect, there were more farmers. But a place is nothing without the people who live there. And so I'm just going to highlight a couple of um, names, a couple of uh, small families that were quite notable during um, the later part of the 19th century in Rillington. Some who contributed more than others to society, because, of course, we all have ancestors or there'll be people in our history projects who lead very quiet lives. There's no records about them. Nothing really happens. But they're all special to us. And I think that's really why even at the very least, if they are recorded as one line on a census or they're counted in a population study, they are still there. And I think if any of us pause to just take a breath and have a look around some of these places and just sort of just slow down for a minute out of modern life and just think about these people from the past, it may be in the churchyard or just somewhere that's quite reflective around there. You can almost hear all these voices. 
And you just look, I love this photograph. This is one family, the Harrison family in Rillington, taken behind a pub. Looks like it may have been a wedding or a special occasion, but you know, you look at the variety of faces in, in you know, in, in those people's lives, and they, they look like simple folk, don't they? You know, I mean, there's nothing particularly special about them from our point of view. They wouldn't have done dramatically notable things in life, but they're special. All of them are special to us. So I think that every society has particularly special people in a notable way who have given a great deal to their community. So here's a couple of those movers and shakers in uh, 18th century Rillington. So we'll have a look first of all at the Piercy family. And our, our friend here, this is a chap called Enos Piercy. And we love Enos because we have a photo of him and he often comes up in our presentations. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, you can see that it's actually quite a early photograph because he died in 1905. And you can just imagine those sort of piercing eyes sort of looking out at the camera. But anyway, Enos, he was born in 1823 in Marishes, which I'll show you in a moment, is not too far from Rillington, and uh, died at, um, in 1905. Now, he was a tailor and draper by trade. His mother was Mary, who was born in 1804. Now, we don't know who Enos's father was, because if we look at the um, baptism records, it shows Enos, son of Mary Piercy of Rillington Spinster. And so we cannot judge what people's lives were like at that time in 1823, but we can't imagine it will be easy for a single mother at that time with a child. Mary's parents were Robert Piercy um, of Rillington, born in 1772, who was a school teacher with his wife, Esther. Now, maybe this tells us something about how they feel because Mary's siblings have some quite wonderfully old religious names, Abel, Laban, Zilpah, Hadassah, Ada, and Maka, and Mary at the beginning. And you kind of wonder, <laughs> was this almost like a um, redemption for what happened with their daughter or were they a heavily religious family or was it simply that there was a trend at that time in victorian times for very religious names but uh, it does make you wonder but anyway back to enos he married elizabeth um, in 1847 in rillington she was a milliner um, so very much in the same trade as enos and they went on to have three children robert another enos and esther ann now, I said earlier that um, Marishes wasn't too far from Rillington, where, which is listed as Enos's place of birth. And you can see here on the map, it's actually quite a short distance away, just um, through through the um, sort of flatter land. It's going away from the walls. And it's a very quiet place. I mean, this this is um, St. Francis Church in Marishes, which is really sort of stuck out on its own with a few farm buildings around there. So very quiet place. And you can really sort of picture that it's not changed very much at all over the years since Enos's time. Now, later in life, because you say he's a tailor and draper, he was a professional. He had his own business um, and he lived in Sledgate, quite near the centre of Rillington in one of these first houses. And here's St Andrews in Rillington. So not only was he baptised here, he was married here and he's also buried here. Now, unfortunately, we can't find his gravestone. There are a few that sort of over towards the edges, which have, have fallen over. And of course, with time, quite a lot of the names have eroded. So sadly, his actual place of burial still eludes us. But what's fascinating is I put the, the baptism entry there, but there, alongside that, it is burial entry. There's Enos and it says for over 60 years, parish clerk of Rillington and Scampston. So bear in mind that early start to his life, you know, unknown father, not listed on the on the baptism register. This chap has pulled himself up. He is a school teacher as a father. So let's assume a quite a professional um, family. He's started his own business. He's been quite successful. You can see him through all the censuses as a tailor and draper. And not only that, he's a parish clerk for such a length of time. But the story doesn't even stop there because a couple of years before he died, this is the 1901 census, 
He's listed as a widower, living alone in Rillington, age 77, as a school board attendance officer. So there's a wonderful sort of irony there that his father was a school teacher and he ended up late in life as an attendance officer. And you hope that his father, you know, sort of looking down on him, appreciated that. So looking in graphical terms, this is then how the PSCs appeared in Rillington. Now, this isn't in a one name study. This, this is trivial. This is one family. But this is a, what we would call a mini one name study. You know, you can look it wider into the PSCs, where they came from, where did they go to? Now, the thing I love the most about this is in 1901, there is one PSC recorded in Rillington and it's Enos, this character who had made such an impact in, in his life. So it's fitting that he should be the last one that was there. And this just really demonstrates that a surname study can be small and fleeting, but it can still be worthy of research. <clears throat> OK, we're going to have a look at another family. This is the Ruston family. Now, Ruston's very much a locational surname, and it's probably derived from one of two places. This, this is Ruston Village, which is only about 10 miles from Rillington. Or there's another one called Ruston Parva, uh, which is about 20 miles from Rillington. And you can see there on the map, you know, in context, it's not that far away. It's just five miles away from the coast at Scarborough. And it's a very small village. It's very, you know, there's a few houses there, predominantly farms. There's no particular village centre. There's no church. So it's a very small place. But one of the earliest entries in the Rillington Parish registers is a chap called John Lamb to an Elizabeth Ruston in 1636. So the name has been around that part of the world for a long time. Now, I'm gonna highlight a few of the Rustons within Rillington um, because that surname proliferated through the sort of 18th to late 19th centuries from around this sort of key farming family and in particular three generations all called Nicholas just to confuse so starting with Nicholas born in 1744 overseer of the poor um, there's the uh, workhouse in Rillington and um, you know it's and you, and you remember I said earlier about the Rillington brick if you look at the side of the building on the left you can see that sort of notable checkerboard pattern that's what we mean by the Rillington brick now, Nicholas married a, uh, a lady called Anne in 1769, and they had a son, Nicholas, who was the second one in the family, and he was a farmer. Now, the Rustons were based at Park Farm, which you can see here towards the top of, of the, of the uh, map. And um, it's quite, it quite a significant um, uh, property. Um, it was 25 parcels of land on the Tithe map. And you can see it there where we've got the sort of the blue circle. Um, interestingly, the sort of pinky circle near it, that's the workhouse. So ironically, the farm was literally right across the road from, from the workhouse. Um, Nicholas and Anne had another Nicholas. And as well as being a farmer, he was a foreman of a duty of his jury, excuse me. Um, so you can detect a pattern here that these are quite notable people with quite significant positions. And confusingly, Nicholas also added, married an Anne Mook. So we have two generations with the same. And they married in 1824 and had a son called Thomas, among some other children. Now, the middle Nicholas was, uh, sorry, the, the, sorry, the first Nicholas, so I'm getting confused, my Nicholas is now, um, was a church warden. And, the, you know, it shows up in the church there. There's a, there's a plaque talking about um, repairing the spire and Nicholas Ruston is listed there as one of the church wardens. And what a clue that we find also is the proximity outside the door to the, um, the graves for the Rustons. They are literally right side, outside the door of the church. So this grave is the two Nicholas and Anne generations, the, uh, the parents and the son with his wife. But also then we get that wonderful additional information that there's a Hannah who died aged four in 1791 and a Kath who was an, an influence for the younger Anne Ruston. Um, just behind on the right, um, there is a grave of Jane Ruston, who was a daughter of the second Nicholas and Anne. And she married a farmer's servant, a chap called David Bilby, um, which you can kind of imagine was probably a drop down in class for 
the Rustons, but um, and it's it's significant that that is her grave there, not her husband's. Nearby, also, they're just uh, you can see the graves we were looking at there, just to the right of the image. Um, the hero Thomas Ruston with his son Thomas. They they love to keep the same names. This family, but there's a real cluster of Ruston graves in this very prominent position, right near the church door. So if we look at the Rustons in context in Rillington, um, obviously in the context of the main population, they're very small numbers. And this is really highlighting the point again about how these are mini one name studies, but they have a right. They have a, a reason to exist about why this family came to the place. Why did they leave? And we're seeing pretty much how we saw that overall spike with the Rillington population in 1851. We're looking at the, at the Rustons in 1871, and there was a larger cluster of them there. Um, you've got to be careful also about wh who these people are, because while we're quite confident that the Rustons of this time were a real cluster who were related, there are certainly some incomers who came later who may not be related. But it's this concept of a mini one name study supporting the one place study. And we can break down this small amount of data, OK, a small amount of data gives smaller results, but it just gives you that sort of supporting information about who these Rustons were. This is the 1871 census, and it shows you that um, you've got predominance, obviously, of scholars and at home, which are the greener colours. Agriculture is the blue. And then there's a single person who is marked as a trade. And there was a, there was a John Ruston who was a bricklayer. But it shows you that sort of predominance of the agriculture. Right, so we're just going to jump out from looking at the graphs, and I'll talk to you a little bit about name and place. Um, the graphs that you've seen so far are within our name and place software. And um, this is something that is a dedicated software solution to help people support in these types of research projects. Um, this is a dashboard for the Rillington project, and you'll see that you get an overview where it shows you a split of names and places and sources and occupations. And this is because it's going beyond typical family tree software and, of course, the sort of bare bones of like an Excel spreadsheet or an empty database. And this is identifying the type of records that we're looking at in this kind of research. If I click through into one of the names, we get our familiar friend Enos here, and there's some tabs there where I can break down his information. And at this particular moment, I'm looking at the life events for him. And this shows his birth and his baptism and his marriage. And under next to the dates are the places. And you may be thinking, well, big deal, Paul. I can do this in my family tree software. But the key difference here is, our places are clickable. So whenever you're recording any of these places against an event, then we are recording where that place happened. And that becomes part of our building block, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, about how we can tear up to that sort of data and that analysis out of name and place. <clears throat> Um, jumping across to facts, it's a similar concept to events, and here it shows a couple of occupations. And here we've got the top block. I'm not quite sure how easily you can read this on your screen, um, but the top block has uh, Enos listed as a tailor. As we know, he was a tailor and draper. It, this information came from a census record, so it's recording that place as his household as it was on that census. The second one records him as a parish clerk because we know from our other research that he, he had that um, uh, that role as well. Um, so in just the same way as we make the places clickable, we also make the occupations clickable so that we're not only, it's, not, it's effectively not a loose text field, it's an intelligent piece of information. So by collecting all the people who were recorded as an ag lab or a tailor or a miner or um, a seamstress, um, we would then be able to, to pull all that information up into some analytics that sort of help with sort of general insight into um, the place or the name study um, and give that sort of population insight into where are the clusters for an occupation or did an occupation increase over time or decrease over time. 
Um, so what I've done there is it flips across to places, and this is a key difference as well, because we all touch a place in our lives. We touch many places in our lives. We're born somewhere, maybe baptized somewhere. We may go to school somewhere. We live somewhere. We work somewhere. We get married somewhere. We die somewhere. We may go to war somewhere. All these places over time. And a key part of name and place in our concept is we record all of those places for each individual. So having that interconnected data enables you to start doing some clever things with the analytics. Because really, to be honest, a lot of this came about by that challenge of how to collate this data. I said earlier about perhaps a good way to start is with a census and layering some of that information on top, but that's okay. You can put a census very easily into a spreadsheet. It's a very um, natural format for it. But when you're wanting to start layering a second census on top or putting in some baptism records or adding in some wills or perhaps a school attendance book, it gets quite challenging then to sort of build up that information. And that's essentially our ground up structure to how we work here. So I can see on this screen for Enos, that he's listed with four places. In fact, there's two entries for St. Andrew's Church, so there's the four events. But it tells me at a glance here that he's, he was, his birth was in Marish's Pickering. He was baptized and married at St. Andrew's in Rillington, and he died in Rillington. And equally, it lists um, household 18 from this example census, both as an occ occupation, which was as a tailor, but equally as a resident. So you're actually a flagging up where people live as well. Now all of these are clickable, so that means that you can then click and you can go across and you can actually start to look at Marish's Pickering in this case. So there's a place record for it. So that's the key uh, of what we're doing as well. Not only are we detailing the people in this in this level, but it's mirrored with the places. So a place may be built. It may have evolved over time. It may have changed. It may be a change of use of a shop to a house. Um, it could have been demolished and rebuilt. It could have been derelict for a while. It could be that ship that's moving around. Um, a place can be any one of these things. But by anchoring the place and then the names of the people that touched that place, or had contact with that place, and then giving a reason why, the glue, so that comes from a source, but then that generates events and facts um, as to why that person touched that place. A place can have events and facts too, because it can be founded, um, it can be, as I say, constructed, uh, it can be demolished, it can have that change of use. And so they have facts too, and name and place records all of that information as well. So you've got this dual uh, so a combination in the database of all the names and all the places with the events and facts joined around them and then that glue that is the source, the reason behind that. Um, you know, and as historical researchers, we're very keen on proper sourcing. And so the, the detail, the level of sourcing you can do in name and place is um, how I believe it should always be done. To the extent, for example, that if you record a will, you can actually list all the names of all the people who are mentioned on the will, even if it's just as the executor or witness, as opposed to someone who's actually a recipient of something in the will. And that can that may be the only time you ever see or hear these of these people in your study. But equally, it could be the only time you see or hear a place. You know, I bequeath to my neighbour, John Wilson, the barn at the end of my field. It's a statement that we could quite easily see on a will. But from that piece of information, we know that there's a chap called John Wilson who was a neighbour of, uh, of, the, of the subject of our will. We know that there was a barn at the end of the field and perhaps then we can go and identify that. And maybe that's that piece of information. Name and place will allow you to record all of those things. So we've got this microscopic level of detail, which are the building blocks then to start to build up how our research projects work. Now, a place needs to be identified as a place, of course. So any place can be pinned on the map and also you've got street view. And if you see the street view image at the bottom, you might just recognize that quite isolated spire of St. Francis at Marish's picking, um, a pickering sort of uh, just cropping up there above the hedges. Um, and the pins can be dragged and dropped. 
So even that barn at the end of the field, there's nothing to stop you moving the pin to the end of the field and saying, right, that's where the barn was, or I think it was. It doesn't even have to appear on a map or be there today. Um, so I say about the sources, how it's, how it's key to us, um, you know, and if I look at the sources for Marish's Pickering, it says there's two sources. And in this case, it's the, the parish baptisms and it's the census, which is the place, the two sources in our project where Enos Piercy was listed. So clearly he was the only person who had anything to do with Marish's in this project. But it actually tells us why the place exists and who it connects to. And again, of course, everything is clickable. So we can click on the Rillington Parish baptisms. And now we're back round to a list of all of the people in the baptism records. And it's constantly circular. There are no cul-de-sacs in name and place. Everything is clickable. Everything is explorable. And it's all joined up in these different views. And as I've touched upon so far in the talk this evening, of course, it's all about the analytics, the outcomes. This is the key. You know, we can spend a lot of time collating the data for our research, but what's the point if we can't do anything with it? We want to understand stories. We want to understand those population changes. We want to understand where the uh, people in our surname study, where they moved to, where they came from, what were their jobs? Who, who did they marry into? Uh, who did they connect to? Who were their neighbors? This is the sort of information and that's really the crux of name and place that where we've got that sort of interconnected building blocks. But equally, you can tear up into this sort of level of analysis. And also optionally for our researchers, they have a public website so you can share your research. I mean, I give a lot of talks about publishing history research online and I'm a big exponent of that, of what I sort of call in the family history world like cousin bait, where, you know, you can Google the names of the people you're interested in and find very simple um, sort of put, put together websites by people at home with the most fascinating information on there. And we're giving people the opportunity to do that within name and place. Yeah. So in, can I say the good part of 2020 at the beginning when it was still kind of normal, um, Ian and I, that's Ian there, uh, went over to Salt Lake City and we launched Name and Place at Roots Tech and we had an energetic, really exciting few days. I Ian was flat out doing demonstrations to the people there and it was a wonderful um, atmosphere, um, you know, and it was a very special moment for us. You know, Pam and I are very passionate about Name and Place. Um, it's as I said, it was born out of our sort of wish really to have the software that we want to use for our own research. So although I'm a software developer by profession, it was never coming at it as a software developer, it was coming at it as I have the skills to be able to solve this problem. And so, you know, it, this is very much a passion project for us. And that means that I have a long, long list of features in my head that I want to put into name and place. And that's why it's showing some of those things like, for example, the detail in sourcing because we understand how it should work and why you'd want it to work. So we have a, a constant stream of uh, releases coming out. I've got to be honest, the bad part of 2020 has made life a little bit challenging for us and it has delayed some of those things, but there is an exciting new release coming out soon with plenty more to come in the future. So anyway, so as we leave Rillington, what does the research of Rillington tell us? Um, we can study the overall um, population over time, their migration patterns. We can look at the industry, the occupation and the wealth. We can see how the place fits within the landscape and its topography and how those features influence life in the village over the years. As anyone is working in a surname study or a local population study, a local history project, a house history project, a one place study will attest. All of these projects are fascinating and addictive, enabling us to take ourselves through layers of detail, analysing and assessing the outcomes of our research. The most excitement comes when you look at people who weren't related to each other simply thrown together through circumstance of a shared surname or a workplace or a home, a place of memorial or a place of rest, how they got to be there, why and where did they go next? 
and I hope this short talk has given you some food for thought and maybe a little bit of inspiration. OK, thank you. Um, OK, we've got Pam with us in the chat um, with us this evening. So we will open it up to some questions about anything about how to integrate these types of studies together. Maybe you're interested in setting up a one place study. Uh, if you're able to know anything more about Rillington or equally anything about name and place, Pam and I will be delighted to answer your questions. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for a fascinating presentation, uh, which I'm sure the uh, all our attendees would have found very informative. So if we'd like to formally welcome Pam Smith to join Paul for the Q&A session and um, hopefully they've, we've got some questions to put to you. Hello, okay, yes, so I've got some. I've got all the questions, Alan. Do you want me to read through? Yep, OK. I've been busy slapping them on to the side, so I was a bit delayed. OK, so the first one is um, from Gay Evans. So she's asking about a picture. So she says, is there a date for the photograph of Myers, Taylor and Draper, please? As I have something similar. Yes, it's, it's about 1905. It was a, a wedding of a local, um, the Taylor Myers, into the Duck family. And uh, we know that the marriage happened in, it's about 1905, but this is one of our many cottage industries. So um, you find that um, many people do have a collection of family histories in a one place study. Um, and certainly on that photograph, um, you can see, you know, we could, it's like a spider's web, the intermarriage. So it's a great, and we have the names of all those people as well. So it's a really cool photograph to have. That's um, that's actually quite common. I've got two one place studies, um, one for um, my maternal side and one for my paternal side. But what I found in both of those was that they are, it's like spaghetti. They just marry each other um, they and they marry con constantly. And I thought originally it was just um, my mum's side that did that. But when I started to look down at Sutera, which is in Sicily, um, actually they're all doing that. And I, can't, I drew the conclusion that it's actually, you're looking at rural parishes. Therefore the marriage pool is much, much smaller. Yes. So it seems very logical um, but of course it's all the names it's all the same and in Italy they keep women keep their maiden name all through their life and because of the naming patterns it means you very often have the same surname and the same first name and it makes it hard to distinguish between one another it really eventually drives you crazy yeah with a one place study in a photograph like this not everybody has the photograph so because it's a collection and we've you know we've started a local history group and people are piling in with the photographs a photograph that one family will have mm. will have images of people from other families and it's that it's that commonality and the sharing of the um, information that we have that's really pulling the community together because that you know the sharing in in photographs like that so it's that's really you know it's a it's a really special part of a study because it's the reminiscence and the personal testimony and the personal photographs that people share. And you wouldn't have that with a family history. You, you know, your, your, your relative may have been a bridesmaid or an attendee at somebody else's wedding, but you wouldn't have the photograph. But with a one place study, you know, you can, you can ask us things because we tend to know most things holistically. Yeah, and that's why I like it, is you can delve deep into their lives. Um, mm -hmm. And it's easy to do it, that you find yourself really fascinated by somebody else's life, and they're not even your connection. But you just have that, I don't know what it is, it's just a, a pull almost, that you just feel that you just have to know everything about this place. Um, yes. It's a special thing. So, next question is in fact this is about another picture so isabel murphy asks what date is the picture of the harrison family 
Um, I, I do know this. The Harrisons were actually publicans of the coach and horses. I just can't bring it to mind, but it's probably um, 1890, something like that. I haven't got the exact date on me, sorry. That's okay. Uh, so, and then the next wasn't a question, it was a kind of a statement. So this is from Chris Galley, who says, if you're considering undertaking a one place study, a good place to start would be to look at the back copies of LPS, which are freely available on the website, where you will find examples of local studies that have been undertaken. This might give you an idea of the sort of studies you could undertake, or you could compare with your study with one that has already been carried out. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. We both said it. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love, I love the local publication studies journal. It, it's fascinating, and I, I love, you know, I think if you haven't seen it, have a look at one of those journals because, in a nutshell, it, it's what we've been talking about tonight. It just shows you how you can just have that wider context to your research, and you know, really sort of drill down into the data, but then bring yourself back up to that. Sort of wider more holistic view yeah he's bringing a parish to life isn't it um, absolutely that's what, I, that's what i love about it um so the next question is from annie berman he says are all of those children esters huge gap between 1808 and 1817 then five children in seven years or are they late baptisms don't know the answer to that you know the baptized when the baptized two of them were born were baptised at the same time, and I did wonder if they were twins, but possibly not. Don't know. Okay. So David Bickett asks, how is your presentation's content held in your one place study? Um, I mean, obviously, Paul has shown how some of that information is held. Um, and I hope for that gave David the answer he needed. Yeah. From a personal point of view, I went into them in place, I don't know, kept up a couple of days ago and started to add a few bits to, to my structure. Um, and it really does make you think about what you've got, what information you have, but also what you don't have. Absolutely. And sometimes, yeah. and sometimes you forget what you don't have and what you need to get. Um, so I walked away for, after spending 30 minutes in there with a long list, um, yes. which was great, but it'll be another few hours. But it's a nice, I, I can say this just because I've looked at it and I, and I like it. It's a nice crisp. Um, it just feels, it looks nice, is what I'm saying. It's nice, clean and crisp. You just feel that you can, you it will work with you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, liken it, I liken it to a swan. You know, it's very calm and peaceful on the top, but it's paddling like stink underneath, you know, assimilating all the data and producing outcomes. And, um, you know, you, you can gather data holistically, all the census, all the, you know, the 1939 register, valuation survey, etc. But then you can layer on the detail, the personal detail, because when you gather data holistically, it creates a page for everybody. And then you can mm -hmm. and a place, a place. So you can start to build from the census, then produce house histories from the places and then produce family histories from the people and how they interconnected, because local historians know that just because we've defined an administrative boundary, people connect across so many areas. They connect through trade associations, religion. So it's not just as defined. So if they were Methodists, they'd be in a circuit, you know, and um, friendly societies pulled in everything, everybody and the, on their feast days and you know, providing a support before the NHS. And it's it's sort of looking at things topically as well as holistically. And that's what name and place helps to do. It can do it by topic, it can do the whole thing. It can slice the data any which way you want. I liken it to a Rubik's cube. That's how I can describe it the best because it's all in there, but you can slice the data however you wish. 
Yeah, I like I liked your comment there, actually, Julie. Thank you. But I mean, in in a nutshell, it, it's from a software point of view, it's part of the challenge in that it's a very complex piece of software in that what it can do already and what it will be able to do. But it's trying to uh, make it nice and easily and intuitive to use. But as you rightly said, you do need to have some structure in your research. And obviously the advantage of having sort of a database that is doing the structuring for you is it does help guide you, but equally it, it does help you put things in a logical um, place. But I guess a message for anybody who's sort of thinking on starting this sort of research is you've got to be logical as we do with, you know, our, our genealogical research or local history research. You know, you've got to be structured in what you do. And certainly this layering of the data sort of reinforces that. OK, um, so the next question is, and this is actually one um, from somebody, a Guild member who wasn't going to be able to be here. Um, and they asked me to ask, um, can name and place be used? just for a regular genealogy, so not anything special, no special studies or focus, just regular, what I would call your own lineage, lineage going back and sideways. Yeah, um, that's a good, that's a great question. I do get this asked this often. I mean, my attitude is that there's a, there's a lot of excellent family history software out there and we've never put ourselves in a place where we think, well, we're directly competing with it, but of course there's a heavy overlap. There are key differentiators, as I spoke about, of name and place where we focus very much on the place and that linkage of data to build up outcomes, which is a different ethos to family history software. And our other key differentiator over family history software is that assumes that everybody generally is related either through birth or marriage who's going to appear in your project and of course we don't have that um yes you obviously can build up family groups within name and place and yes there will be sort of like uh, quite nice pedigree charts and things like that because of course that is part of the research but um i wouldn't say i'd call it overkill to use name and place just for family history research but it's um it can do so much more so I think it would it would serve a purpose more if you're looking at a wider project. So really, if you just use it for family history, you're underusing the, the software. Absolutely. So you, you're not buying a sweater a size bigger because you're gonna you know you're gonna put weight on. So essentially, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's one more question. So if anyone else has got any questions, please just put them in the the thing on the dashboard. Um, so this one's again from David Bickett, who says, "Do or can you include DNA results in a one place study? For example, Enos Piercy's father is unknown, but if you might be able to search him using a wide DNA test." Absolutely. Uh, spot on. I mean, in, in just the same way as any other source of information, DNA is key. And um, yes, you can put DNA records into name and place. Well, we've exhausted all the questions. So okay, maybe I could, perhaps if I can ask one there. Um, I, th I think I heard Julie saying that she, she's using it for Italy. So presumably there's no geographical restriction on Absolutely. Where you're doing your one place study. Yeah, Ab absolutely, Alan. No, that's a very good point. And it was, it, you know, in those wonderful days when we still had face to face um, shows. And I can't wait for that day again. You know, when you get the opportunity to, to speak to different people. I had a very lengthy conversation, I think, at Roots Tech in London with the um, uh, sort of Chinese family history research people. And my goodness, you know, we, we think we do things a little bit different sometimes. But when I delved down into what they actually needed, and they have some very particular challenges, there was nothing that we couldn't do. And I think the fundamental building blocks of research about how you structure those names, places, how they connect to people, the events, sources and facts sort of transcends anything else. So there's absolutely no harm in having uh, a study working anywhere. We've obviously got a lot of interest from the US. But equally, you know, you touched on DNA um, earlier. You know, the DNA projects can be put into name and place, so you can actually record people effectively globally who are within that DNA study. So, um, you know, the place can be anywhere. And also okay. it can move, as I said, with the ship. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think we've got one final question come in, um, which is, 
when will a GEDCOM be able to go straight into name and place? Yep, great question. Not in the release that's coming out now, but the one that's straight after, what's B1.3. So it'll certainly be before, be before the end of this year. Okay, and maybe if I can just ask one final question. Um, is there any sort of like a free demo that program that you can actually sort of just have as a test to see, yep. get a feel for the program and see how you like it before you go and purchase? Absolutely. Um, we have a free two week trial of name and place with no obligation. Um, the way our card system works is it does require a credit card up front, just the same as Ancestry does, but there's nothing sinister in that. Um, you can cancel at any time. You also have the advantage is it's still quite early software and it's a great uh, opportunity. You can have a one to one tutorial with Pam over Zoom who will talk to you about your project and show you how that name and place can help. And I know that people who have taken advantage of that have really sort of it's it's helped us to um, get past that fact where we can't speak to people face to face at shows that we've been able okay. to do that. So, um, yeah, details are on our website and equally okay. um, we'll very, you know, people can contact us. We'll happily answer any questions. OK, brilliant. Um, well, unfortunately, uh, our time is against us tonight. Um, we hope that everybody's found this second webinar informative and enjoyable and that you will want to join us for the further webinars in this series, which take place on the next four Wednesdays. Registration is already open for all of these. Uh, the next one scheduled for a week today, Wednesday, the 21st of October, being the first of our LPSS presentations by Dr. Andrew Hind on creating a publicly available common format database of parish register data on baptisms, marriages and burials. So that's a week today. I'd like to thank my SEMSUB colleagues and the Guild marketing team again for their support in the background. And on behalf of the whole team, I'd like to thank you all for joining us again today. And again, thank you to Paul and Pam for being part of that. As you exit the webinar, there will be a feedback survey. So we'd be very grateful if you take a few minutes to complete this as all your comments can help shape the future webinars we plan until we can again, hopefully, meet in person. So in the meantime, stay safe. Thank you and good night.